Welcome to CSI Coatesville. This is our study on fingerprints, part one. Today we're going to look at characteristics of fingerprints and how fingerprints are created. Now, you may be wondering when fingerprints first began to be used in the criminal justice system. Of course, fingerprints have been used uh, going back to ancient times in China where fingerprints were used in identifying the owners of clay pots and so forth. But in the criminal justice system, it's a fairly recent development. Consider these two individuals that you see here before you. The person at the top of the screen, his name is Will West. The one below is William West. Both of these men were incarcerated in Leavenworth Prison between the years 1903 and 1909 as inmates. They're surprisingly similar in their appearance, but that's not all. During this period in time, there was a system of identifying inmates in the criminal justice system known as anthropometry. Now, this is developed by a researcher by the name of Alphonse Bertillon, who developed a very detailed system of measurement in it to identify and distinguish one criminal from another. In this system that was used to identify criminals, the measurements that were on these two gentlemen were virtually identical across about 15 different measurements. So that made them virtually indistinguishable regarding the criminal justice system. How is that problem going to be solved? Well, we'll come back to that. In today's program, we're going to look at fingerprint science and how fingerprints are created. First, fingerprint science. What is it called? Can you say dactyloscopy? That's right, dactyloscopy is the study of fingerprints was first pioneered by an Argentinian official known as Juan Busetich in 1891. So it's been around for a while prior to the Will West and William West controversy that occurred in Leavenworth Prison. Keep in mind that fingerprints are an individual characteristic. In other words, only you and no one else, as far as we know on the planet Earth, has this, the exact same fingerprints. They also remain unchanged throughout lifetime. The only possible exception of that being those that are stonemasons that basically wear their fingerprints off over the course of their lifetime. Since they're individual, you would think, well, that's going to be very difficult to systematize. Well, fortunately for us, the tremendous advantage of fingerprints is that there are ridge patterns that allow them to be systematically classified. We'll be looking at that in a future program. Now, what causes fingerprints? Take a look at this detailed diagram that you see before you here. You'll notice that you're seeing different layers of our skin. We can see the outer layer. You can see labeled here as the epidermis, which is this area here. And directly underneath the epidermis is the dermis. And this is a highly vascular area that has uh, a variety of different organs that you can see. The boundary between these two layers is known as the papillae that you can see um, in red here as I'm drawing it. Now this occurs everywhere underneath your skin and yet these take on a particular role when we're looking at fingers because as you and I develop within the womb this is actually what causes our fingerprints to be created. So it's actually not the epidermis that causes our fingerprint patterns but those ridge patterns are merely telegraphed through the epidermis from this area that we're calling the papillae, which is the boundary between the epidermis and the dermis, which underlies it. Another question, what do fingerprints actually contain? Well, it wouldn't surprise you that 98 to 99% of fingerprints are actually water, but that also creates a problem because that means since water is going to evaporate out of our perspiration, that means that we're only dealing with one or two percent of those fluids that leave our hands onto surfaces, which means that we're dealing with a very small amount of material. 
Now, what do these fluids contain? Well, as you can see, they contain oils, as you would expect. Nearly half of that mass that remains is salts. There are also some amino acids. If you recall, amino acids are those kinds of compounds from which proteins are made. And it's very important to keep these in mind because we can apply chemical tests in some cases to different surfaces in order to visualize those fingerprints if they're not otherwise able to be visible. So we have basically a millionth of a gram of material that we're relying upon in order to recover those fingerprints. Not a lot to work with. And yet, as you'll see in a future program, we have several means of causing those fingerprints to be visualized. Now, how are fingerprints made? Well, we take an ink pad that you can see pictured here in the photograph, and you're going to merely roll the finger from left to right uh, across that ink pad. Um, actually, it's from the outside of a person's hand to the inside of a person's hand. And roll that finger across a piece of cardstock from one side of the fingernail all the way to the other, and keep the hand and forearm as parallel as you can to the surface of the tabletop. Roll only once because you, want, you don't want to back roll on that fingerprint as that will create more than one image. You want to avoid over inking and under inking as well as this will either produce dark regions that are undistinguishable or gaps in the fingerprint pattern itself. You also want to be aware of turning the wrist or hand as that can cause smudging. And of course it's going to take practice. You're not going to get this all the first time that you do it. Let's go back to these two criminals that we identified at the top of their program. How are they distinguished from one another? Fortunately for the criminal justice system, the need was realized that anthropometry was not going to work in this or other situations for a variety of reasons. And so while these gentlemen were there as inmates, they were able to be distinguished by this new identification system. That's right, fingerprinting. And that's how we can tell them apart. Now, consider the following. What are fingerprints composed of and how are they deposited? Secondly, are there other body parts that can produce unique patterns as well? You could probably think of three others if you think about it. And then, finally, is DNA really a better form of identification than fingerprints? Consider that question and elaborate on your response. That's all time we have for now, and as always, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.